Bom dia, gente. Tudo bem? Good morning for all. We will give continuous to the course of Professor Simonovic. And the floor is yours. <laughs> Bom dia and good morning, guys. Um, nice to see you. And you are surviving the overload of lectures and presentations in these few days. Today we are going to switch the gears and I'm going to talk a little bit about a different topic. And I thought it's uh, interesting because that particular topic is directly related to the practice of you know, water resources engineering and the way how the climate change can be, uh, can be kind of introduced to help the practice. Uh, uh, Marina immediately noticed that you know, the topic of the presentation is in conflict with my previous presentations in which I was saying that the use of standards is not anymore the direction to go. However, that's the you know, move from standards to you know, uh, performance-based engineering is a transition and it's going to take some time. And practicing engineers are still, uh, still using, uh, using the traditional way, but do realize the need for uh, uh, updating these kind of procedures in order to address the issues related to changing climatic conditions. So I'm going to talk about the uh, a web-based tool that we have developed at uh, University of Western Ontario and it's publicly available and being used uh, in Canada and the tool's main objective is uh, to update the intensity duration frequency curves for uh, the whole for the whole country. Uh, it uh, got a lot of attention and uh, we do have a registration and right now there is approximately 2,700 registered and active users of the tool. Most of them basically practicing engineers are very, very heavily relying on that so on. Um, this is the way everyone can access the tool. I will try a little bit maybe in the second part of the morning to maybe demonstrate, but I am my <coughs> I am I am permanently forgetting my password and <laughs> I need I need to get a new password for the uh, for the access. When you go to the website, you kind of register, then, then you can uh, use it. Just be careful, the tool is developed for Canada <laughs> and for the locations in Canada. I had a presentation where someone from the audience proudly told me that they were using the tool for one of the Caribbean countries and I <laughs> said that's not working because uh, actually the tool works, uh, it works, but it connects to the two closest stations in Canada. So you can imagine the difference. Um, this is developed only for Canada. The reason I am presenting it to you because I think something like that can be nicely possibly developed, you know, developed for your needs if the needs are there. Uh, uh, the development was done at our university and the current kind of ownership and maintenance and support for the tool is being provided by the institute that I'm associated with. It's called the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. It is a, a, a research private partnership between the university and the insurance industry and they are providing now the annual budget to kind of keep the tool updated, going, and that innovations and modifications can be done so that the tool remains, uh, remains relevant. The number of people involved in the development of the tool, the development of the kind of theoretical background as well as the, as you will see, the, the very, very friendly uh, web environment and your compatriot Andres Chardon, who is now Canadian <laughs> from Porto Alegre, uh, was actually instrumental and is still working with me on the maintaining that particular tool. Um, I'll go through the kind of introduction of what the tool is for, explain a little bit of the uh, methodology that we used and then uh, walk you through the process of kind of implementation and use, uh, use of the tool. If we succeed, if I get the uh, uh, help with the password, we can, we can log in and you know, I'll demonstrate how the tool can be, can be used. Okay, uh, so the kind of main justification for the development of the tool is coming from the fact that uh, in 
increase or the global warming and change in frequency and in intensity of the uh, uh, extreme, extreme events are linked. Uh, the IPCC and the literature on the climate change is not providing very explicit kind of linkage between the extreme events and the global temperature, but they are definitely now documented uh, uh, changes in the frequency, magnitude of the extreme events, and I think with the more information and more data, this will be even further, uh, that the relation will be even further strengthened. The, 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 the point is that these kind of changes <laughs> in extreme events are directly affecting all the activities that are being conducted within the municipal boundaries. Um, you were talking, we were talking yesterday of what the municipalities in Brazil are expecting. Um, there are risks associated with flooding, with droughts. There are uh, issues related to water supply, uh, drainage, uh, water quality, and so on. And they're all kind of related to our knowledge and understanding what are the extremes uh, that are hitting these environments. So assessment of extreme precipitation is becoming one of the really key activities within the urban, uh, sorry, within the municipal engineering in planning new infrastructure, in operating existing infrastructure, in uh, doing the design for, uh, for the future and so on. I was giving you some examples of the pretty serious events that hit Canada recently. This was in the same year. We had a very large flood that hit the city of Calgary. It was a very fast snow melt that basically from the Rocky Mountains put tremendous amount of water in the Bow River. And this is the downtown of the city in June of 2013. The damage to the city, Calgary is the city in central part. You maybe heard the Winter Olympics were organized there and so. Um, the, 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 the damage in this case was pro, pro approximately 6.2 billion Canadian dollars. Huge, because the whole downtown was flooded and these are all commercial buildings and as well as many you know, residential buildings, infrastructure, everything was uh, inundated. The interesting point is that about six weeks after that, uh, in July, the Toronto was hit with that storm that I told you that lasted only two hours and generated another $1.2 million of damage for that city. So, so you can see that within, within like two months, uh, approximately $8 billion of damage. So that was a pretty serious concern for the Canadian government and for the first time that uh, at the highest possible level of the Prime Minister's office, pretty serious attention was given to extreme events and what should we do to actually deal with these extremes in a better way in order to prevent or reduce or reduce this type of damage. <coughs> so in all these activities uh, within the municipalities, the engineers today are using um, intensity duration frequency curves. This is a very common engineering tool and you know from designing pipes to kind of operating the pump stations and so on you utilize the idfs to come up with that you know kind of standard or design uh, design precipitation value uh, um, the the in in canada the intensity duration frequency curves are uh, their development and dissemination are the responsibility of the federal department of, it's called now environment and climate change. They provide the product like this uh, and the product is basically showing the, the, the distribution or the probabilistic relation between the duration of the precipitation, intensity uh, and the return and the return period. The uh, Environment Canada is providing these uh, uh, intensity duration frequency relationships only based on the historical observations. Uh, there is over uh, 1,700 stations across the country. Uh, many of them do have uh, uh, sub daily observations or the, the measurements of the shorter duration precipitation. And all this data is processed, checked, and then disseminated by the, by the government. The observations are fitted by the Gumbel distribution, which is a one parameter extreme value distribution. And this is one of the kind of 
theoretical issues that we have with the department because the research is showing that there are much more uh, um, or better distributions for fitting the extreme values than Gumbel. However, they still maintain that there is no strong justification, but it seems the practice is not changing. Um, by using the kind of historical information to come up with these relationships, we are basically introducing the assumption, <coughs> the assumption that the past or what was observed in the past will be of value in the future, that the world is kind of you know, stationary. And um, with the climate change and with many you know, studies being done uh, uh, on the consequences of the climate change, that question or the stationarity is you know, put under the very serious question mark. So that the, 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 the message is that due to these changing changes, uh, uh, the non-stationarity is introduced into the process and therefore use of the kind of historical information for the future activities is not, um, is not appropriate. And it's very interesting, when we were doing the initial studies on the impacts of climate change, I was going to, you know, visiting different municipalities across the country, asked to present some uh, lectures on the, how the climate change is affecting uh, uh, the, the water resources management. And almost ev in every municipality I started getting questions, you know, okay, we already see the difference. Uh, we see that, you know, situations like this are being more common and, uh, um, you know, more severe. <coughs> How can we deal with that? You know, what, what can we do with it? And obviously, obviously something was necessary to be done uh, in, to respond to that. And the main issue was that these municipalities and municipal engineers really didn't have the capacity, neither research nor, you know, kind of practical knowledge and ability to kind of see and bring uh, the climate change into, into their activities. So th there was a need. There was a very clear need to provide some support, you know, for that. Um, uh, I, I was doing the work in climate change and climate change impacts and uh, you have seen you know, some of the elements of the work we did for the City of London and after doing that project for the City of London when the risk of flooding under the climate change was estimated, I got from the same people immediately the question, what can we do with the IDF curves that we are using in the City of London? And I said, we can maybe try to develop methodology and kind of build on a previous work. And uh, for the first time, we actually did that. We developed the process how to update the curves for London as well as in the same time the insurance bureau insurance bureau in our case is a kind of umbrella organization that puts together all different insurance companies and they immediately followed with the uh, kind of questions okay for us this is very essential in providing the insurance for the infrastructure with uh, to to kind of see how the climate change may uh, may modify the conditions so they gave us another project to actually look at the number of cities across the country and uh, test this methodology so we had opportunity in a kind of research setup with the practical requirements to go through the process of developing methodology, how to, how to modify these relationships in order to address the climate change. So based, uh, based on that work, an opportunity came up somewhere in 2013 uh, through the so-called the Canadian Water Network. Canadian Water Network was established by our funding agencies where they put a special fund uh, uh, to kind of deal with a number of water-related research questions. And that network was given, I think, something like 15, 17 million dollars uh, to support the research in various activities and the researchers from different organizations had the opportunity to apply to the network and obtain, obtain funding for their research. So they came up with a very interesting call. Um, they said, we are interested, we are not interested to continue uh, the research in this area, but we will be interested to see is there uh, or are there any kind of research uh, results that can be transferred into the practice. 
So that was a kind of call for the knowledge transfer, very specific, very rarely you get the opportunity to actually get the funding to do something like that. And I kind of took that opportunity, applied with this idea to possibly develop the tool that can be used, uh, that can be used by the practice. Uh, succeeded in obtaining the funding from them, initial funding, very, very modest funding, not much money, but I think it was very effectively, and the moment was right, very effectively used to produce what I am talking about. So, in that particular proposal, we set as objectives development of the generalized methodology for updating the curves under the changing climate and then implementing this into kind of web-based format so that the, the, the municipalities and under which do not have that high level of technical capability can effectively utilize the tool in doing their work but not being overloaded with you know, relatively complex and sophisticated procedures of <coughs> bringing the climate change into, into that process. So uh, uh, after succeeding the in, in uh, obtaining the funds, uh, we went into the process of the development and these are the kind of outcomes. The tool was introduced into the practice or made public in 2015. I'll describe the process of the development of the tool because I think that's also interesting for you. And then we continue updating, modifying up to the last moment, like um, in August of this year, like just a month ago or half a month ago, we actually published the fourth version of the tool, uh, in really trying to keep it as current as possible from the methodological point of view, as well as from the data point of view. So all the new and available data is permanently being added to the tool so that the engineers now have you know, the kind of state of the art available. This was the last time I gave the <laughs> lecture, but I'm daily kind of getting the, uh, getting the information of the people who are registered and actively using, and the number is already around 2,700. One interesting point was I already mentioned that my motivation came up from the discussions <laughs> with municipalities. And my expectation was, and you will see how we structure the development process, my expectation was that municipalities are going and municipal engineers are going to be the main users. And then when you know, the people started registering and using, I realized that about 80%, 85% of the users are consultants. So basically the engineers who are doing work to make money <laughs> are utilizing now this publicly developed and available tool. And then talking to the municipalities, I kind of learned that it seems that the issues in liability and everything else are preventing directly municipalities from using the tool. They actually like to uh, involve, the, involve the consultants in design, in you know, development of different uh, projects and things like that. <coughs> Uh, because of the direct liability uh, to the customers and, and, and population within the municipality. So if I knew that, you know, we could have charged a little bit and become rich, you know. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, that doesn't, uh, doesn't apply anymore. Okay, so this is the story of the beginning and motivation and sorry for the very small font, but I'm going to kind of lead you. This is describing the kind of process uh, how we decided to go through the development of the tool and basically involve those who may need the tool to help us develop something or develop the product that will meet, meet, the, needs, uh, meet the needs of practice. So we did uh, three different uh, kind of things in involving uh, people. First one was uh, um, contacting number of cities to see are they willing to kind of work with us on a kind of permanent basis to shape the tool to meet the real practical needs. Um, we succeeded in getting the people very highly <coughs> ranked in the uh, a very large city, city of Toronto, and one medium-sized city, city of Hamilton, 
and two uh, chief engineers were basically working with us on a regular basis, following the, each step of the development and giving us pro or providing feedback, you know, is this going to be well accepted, not well accepted, what should we modify and how should we tweak the tool to economy. So that help was really essential and it was kind of going on uh, uh, permanently. The second form of the involvement was uh, uh, discussion with the municipalities. So we organized the kind of number of uh, a number of workshops across the country and because the funding was relatively modest we were not able to do that you know very often we did it um, twice first when the tool was in a draft form so that we were able to kind of demonstrate and see the feedback and second was when the tool was done to kind of help transfer some uh, knowledge how the tool can be used and the the, the complement to this two sets of workshops, physical workshops that we uh, conducted across the country. We had towards the end, uh, the kind of with the announcement that the tool is becoming public, we had a web workshop and that was, a, I'll tell you the story, it was a disaster. It was a total disaster. First to tell you, the, 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 the work with these two engineers on a regular basis was extremely successful and very positively accepted by them as well as helpful for us. The workshops also offered a lot of input and it was very interesting. This was the first time that we realized that we are not talking only to, to municipal engineers, we are talking actually to consultants and the consultants are involved with projects from, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, the, you know, number of millions of dollars. So it, the questions were extremely serious and those who were working on a very for a large clients and very large projects, they wanted to know a lot of details. What you know is the, in the background of the tool, how reliable is you know the information, how they should use the tool in the most efficient way. You know, to the, and and you will see that there are ways of utilizing the tool. When I explain that. So, so the feedback was very effective, very effective, very helpful, and we even documented that in one publication, you know, how the feedback was provided. And this ending workshop, I need to tell you, we, we actually hired the professional agency that organized this, and we were expecting that we are going to get, you know, something like up to 100 people. They did guarantee that, you know, the system is capable of managing. And we got about 290 people joining the web, uh, webinar at the beginning and the whole system crashed. <laughs> it was not able. So we didn't realize how high is the level of interest among the general you know, public for something like that. So we corrected that you know, after a while with you know, uh, finding the way how to accommodate more people and that was repeated. But it was a, it was a shock. I was, I was a little bit sick so we did it from my home. And, and everything started falling apart. <laughs> you know, the, our communication with the organizing, which was in a kind of digital uh, form, you know, through, and the support that was coming from them, and the panic in the company because people were permanently trying to join, and the system was not able to kind of respond. It was it was quite quite an experience, and uh, so so you see that in this process we really followed. Uh, very heavily, very heavily, you know, maintenance of the communication with the practice and those who will be using the tool. Uh, here are some of the basic characteristics of the different versions. Just, and I'll be talking about details of each of them, but in the first version of the tool, uh, the methodology that we utilized is based on using the global climate models and the precipitation information from the global climate models, and particular way of downscaling, uh, downscaling the information in time. The 
climate models are producing, uh, producing precipitation information up to the daily uh, time step and development of IDF curves requires sub-daily information. So we utilize the observed sub-daily information and daily information from the models uh, through the, to develop the downscaling scheme uh, that was able to then predict and basically come up with the sub-daily sub -daily, uh, values for the future. Um, at the beginning, in 2013, uh, there were 24 GCMs or global climate models available that were providing for all the emission scenarios the necessary daily data. And uh, at that time, we developed the original downscaling, downscaling procedure. I wanted to be on a kind of both research as well as, as the practical side. Uh, the, everything that we do in the development of tool gets some kind of confirmation. So when, the, uh, when we developed this algorithm, we immediately made an attempt to publish it, to get the feedback from the professional community and the in international journals that you know, this makes sense in the context of the research, uh, in the research context or knowledge at, uh, at that time. Um, after a while, uh, with the new technology available and some uh, new uh, climate models and new climate data available, we proceeded with updating the tool, changing a little bit the interface to make it you know, more flexible, adding uh, bias-corrected models that were produced by another uh, consortium in Canada and right now is the main source of the all climate, uh, climate information. So we had a 24 row uh, climate models still in the database and then we added these bias corrected models which were obviously one step ahead in um, providing the climate information. Modify the methodology, um, the, this was a kind of controversial step because we were, uh, we were switching from the gumball that the government is using to uh, a generalized extreme value distribution and that was basically suggested by the literature as definitely more effective way of fitting the extreme precipitation data. Uh, the tool still has both of them inside, uh, but um, we are allowing tool to use the gumball for the historical data and you will see with the tool you can generate the historical IDF curves and updated curves. For the updated we eliminated Gumbel and we are uh, using the GEV right now. Uh, the reason why we kept uh, Gumbel for the historical is that basically with the tool you can in a you know, second produce the IDFs that government is disseminating. You can check the tool. You can see that we are utilizing the same kind of data, utilizing the same uh, statistical distribution and generating the product that governs. So, so, so this, part, this part is completely the same. It just gives you opportunity to do that in the tool. Uh, but the future is something that you don't have anything to compare with, so this is where our knowledge was incorporated. In the third version, uh, we, yes, after the version two, uh, we had another uh, set of workshops, um, and these workshops were mostly focusing on the application, how the tool can be used. And almost everywhere uh, we met with the users, the requirements started coming, you know, what are we going to do for ungaged locations? In the first two versions, we were focusing on the gauged locations, the stations where the data was available, uh, historical data available, and we were updating in these stations uh, on the IDFs for the future. But the questions were permanently coming out, what are we going to do for the locations where we don't have measurements? There are so many, especially new developments and designs are in the regions where the stations do not exist and you know how the tool can help and so. So we did a pretty serious, uh, uh, serious thinking about that and developed completely new, completely new product and module within the tool to, uh, to address the ungaged locations. 
So now, the, after the version 3, the tool has two different modules. One is for the gauged locations, and another one is for ungaged locations. Obviously, the approach for ungaged locations needed to be different. I'll tell you, uh, you know, how we did that. And with this particular kind of uh, s second option, you can actually click on any location within the country, and you will get the IDF relationships uh, and updated relationships for the future. Final version that was maybe two, three weeks back um, <laughs> included the, uh, the very new set of the climate models. So now basically all the original models are now replaced with the new products, with the bias corrected models. Again, this uh, consortium uh, is Pacific Climate and Transition Consortium is responsible and paid by our government to do that and we are kind of updating as they make the climate information available we immediately bring that into the tool into the tool database uh, the 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 consortium provides very detail first they have a website that you can download all the information for any location in canada um, <coughs> and they also provide the information how is this bias correction done because that's uh, one of the sensitive issues in utilizing the climate models. There are different ways how you can bias correct them. And depending on the choice of the bias correction method, you may get <laughs> different, different, climate, uh, different climate information. So they tested, they're using this particular uh, uh, method for bias correction. There is a description of that method, justification for its use. And we kind of distance the tool from, you know, this climate inputs. They are part of the database of the tool but the work is done by the climatologists and those who are um, kind of doing that on a regular basis. And this is where we are right now, right now with the tool. Let me give you um, the kind of uh, <coughs> information about the methodology. And I'll talk first about the, I'll talk first about the gauged locations uh, for which tool was originally originally designed. That this is the interface that I was mentioning. You will see a little bit later if I get the uh, I, uh, if I get the password that the tool uh, has two modules and you select the kind of path you want to go through the tool for gauged and ungaged locations. And very, very, in a very simple way, um, you perform the uh, you perform this process. So the interface is the initial step. The interface offers you know a lot of kind of information. What is new in the tool? Any publication that's related to either methodology or the work uh, related to the tool is made available. Um, there is a user and uh, technical manual. They are available for download and also the tool offers opportunity for the users to contact us. And we do, we do get the questions, you know, from time to time. Unfortunately, you know, we don't have enough resources that we can kind of devote that to be a service. Like if you need help, we can immediately respond. Um, <coughs> and um, with the modest funding that we have to maintain the tool, we try to answer the question and point the users in the right directions, but it is in the users' hands really to understand and, and um, um <coughs> see how the tool can be, can be used. So the, the, the starting point, the starting point uh, in the gauge location is the kind of map of Canada, about 750 stations are available and for each of the stations um, the historical data are <coughs> uploaded into the, into the tools database and this is all the time being kind of checked with the Environment Canada Department, which is responsible for, <coughs> sorry about the voice, uh, which is responsible, which is responsible for ob making the observations and documenting the observations. So we are trying to keep that um, um, permanent uh, and updated to the level um, that is available. 
uh, the, you as a user have opportunity to kind of click on the station. They are identified within these circles. If you zoom in, you will see actually exact locations. You can do the search by the station ID number or by the name, by the name of the location. Sorry if I can do something. <coughs> When I talk too much, I lose my voice. <coughs> okay, um, so 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 now um, in the in the tools database are these 24 statistically downscale global models uh, created by this uh, um, through the bias correction by this consortium, and um, this is being done kind of outside uh, out out. Am I doing something? No. Uh, outside of the tool, um, I'm just showing you, for example, the kind of website that the consortium is providing. That's now the main source of climate information for Canada. Um, the consortium is based and located at the um, you know, west coast at the University of Victoria, where the Canadian Climate Centre is located. Uh, we have a, climate, a Canadian <laughs> climate model, and this group is permanently kind of involved with uh, development of the <coughs> climate products. The second important part of the methodology is that for all the locations, uh, the historical data is fitted, I already mentioned, with the Gumbel distribution, which is extreme value, one parameter distribution. I suppose many of you may be familiar. Relatively, uh, relatively straightforward uh, fitting distribution, but not as good for the extreme values as may other based on a kind of theory. The distribution has, you know, the, the parameters that is, uh, uh, the, the, sorry, two parameters that are being estimated. We use the method of monuments. So it's a completely the same way as the Environment Canada and Climate Change Canada is using in fitting the historical and producing the historical IDF curves. Um, in the last version, and it's actually from the version 3, for the future IDFs, uh, because of the uh, very heavy discussion in the literature that, you know, Gumball is not the best for the extreme precipitation, we decided to modify the approach and we introduced, uh, we introduced the generalized uh, uh, extreme value distribution. This distribution has more parameters, uh, requires a little bit more complex estimation process. We utilize the, oof, I'm sorry. How do I get the back? I press the wrong button. Uh, it, it is using the L moments uh, method of estimation for the parameters and uh, kind of fitting the distribution process is relatively, you know, common and straightforward. But the point is uh, that the choice of the distribution is affecting our downscaling, downscaling method. And uh, downscaling is essential here because most of the climate information needs to be brought to different temporal scale and also the kind of historical link between the historical and the future conditions needs to be established through the downscaling process. So uh, using Humble uh, require a different type of relationship between these values that you are downscaling or you are relating and using uh, uh, extreme value requires modification. So, so that we call that quantile matching algorithm for downscaling uh, was affected by the choice of the distribution. Very <coughs> neat feature, mathematical feature of the Gamble distribution is that the relationship uh, between two variables that are distributed according to the Gamble becomes linear. So that was very useful and very effective in the calculation. The moment when you switch to more complex distribution, like the GEV, uh, that relationship is not anymore, anymore linear, and we needed, uh, we needed a little bit more sophisticated way of 
capturing the relationship between the daily and sub-daily and the daily to, uh, in the history and the daily in the future. These are the two. So, so this is the, the quantile matching downscaling algorithm. So the purpose of the algorithm was to establish two types of relationship. So one was the relationship between the daily precipitation values and sub-daily, which are required for the uh, uh, fitting the distribution um, and developing IDF curves. And the second downscaling was relating the daily historical uh, information to daily future under different climate models information. So by doing this, establishing these two relationships, we were able to now uh, come up with the sub-daily information for the future, which were based on the daily uh, uh, values produced by the climate models. And in that process, um, there is a very strong assumption. And the assumption is that the relationship that exists in the historical context between daily and sub-daily remains the same for the future. And that's probably not the case because of the non-stationarity, uh, this relationship may be in a different form. And that's the topic we are right now working on, basically how to bring this non-stationarity into this process. For now, this is a very clear assumption. It's very well documented and explained so that the users do realize that you know, what we have has some limitations. So <coughs> this is the quantile matching algorithm or this downscaling that includes these two uh, relationships. Uh, historical sub-daily data, historical daily data are subject to you know, extracting maximums, fitting the distribution, and then developing this relationship. I said in under the gamble, it's a linear, under the GEV, it's a more complex nonlinear relationship, but using this relationship, you can generate the IDF curves for the future by adding the, another relationship, and that's the relationship between the historical daily data with the future model or the climate model daily data. Again, the same kind of extraction of the maximum, fitting the distribution, and having the relationship that's then combined with the relationship between sub-daily and daily, and ending up with giving us together the sub-daily information for the future that can be then presented in the form of the updated IDF curves. That's the, that's the kind of really the meat of the downscaling and this quantile matching algorithm has been published, accepted by the uh, community and that's what I was kind of telling you about that Basically, we use the distribution functions uh, of the you know, future and blue observation, uh, developing, uh, after reducing the bi uh, bias, developing this relationship. And also, we use the sub-daily and daily observations to develop the other relationship. And these two relationships are the kind of key in, the, in this algorithm that are producing the final final data for presentation. Um, this is the kind of mathematical explanation of the relationships and how they are being developed. Uh, uh, um, and uh, we used in kind of fitting this relationship between the daily and sub-daily and between daily past and daily future, uh, we used a small uh, optimization algorithm to kind of best fit the relationship, you know, between the values and the scaling or the values are uh, generated through coming up, coming up with the relationship which is utilizing the kind of uh, uh, climatic variable, in, in our case precipitation, and the, the factor that is modifying that precipitation for the future conditions. So this was the methodology being used for the location where we have observations, so that you realize in these two relationships we used the historically observed daily data, we used historically observed sub-daily data in these two relationships. Um, 
However, if you don't have the, uh, or if you go anywhere outside of the engaged locations, um, the same kind of idea cannot be, cannot be utilized. So we started looking in what can be done and uh, developed pretty original procedure for unengaged locations. <coughs> One, uh, yeah, maybe I should mention the kind of intermediate step. Um, uh, in early days of the request for unengaged locations, we utilize the previously described product for the uh, gauged locations and then with the spatial interpolation created the values of IDFs across the country. That, that was a very rough approximation because you know, our country is very specific. Uh, most of the population lives you know, 80 kilometers from the US-Canada border and obviously this is where most of the stations are, most of the data available, and then you have a huge <laughs> country above or north from there where no information is available and a very small you know, percent of the population is located. So that uneven density and distribution of the observations are, you know, is making any interpolation, any interpolation very, very rough. And uh, we did produce the maps so that you can kind of use them as orientation, but if you have a station which is like a, uh, or location which is 2,000 kilometers from the you know, closest, <laughs> closest observation point, that in a precipitation domain doesn't make any major sense. So what we have done in this, uh, we actually utilize the historical data for the observed stations and we utilize so-called derived products, uh, reassessment or reanalysis products, which are based on, which are nothing else than basically information for different locations derived from the use of climate models with the historical, with the historical information. So North American reanalysis and European reanalysis are the databases that are giving you for the historical period the climate variables, in our case precipitation, in a gridded form covering, uh, covering the whole uh, uh, region of your interest. And this information then can be kind of utilized. So it is a derived product, but it's the best and what you know, most of people are uh, using nowadays, uh, usually using to kind of add to the observations, to existing kind of historically observed, uh, observed data. I am right now in the hotel after the presentations <laughs> reading a thesis where um, some work was done on the very small island, um, Caribbean island, and uh, the, the lady that was doing the thesis basically used, uh, because they're interested in hurricanes and flooding and everything else, and she is using the reanalysis data because there is no historical or very limited historical observations in the location like that. So we utilized the, the reanalysis data for the period from 1979 to 2000 and 2013, basically now covering the whole country in a grid form uh, with, the, with the information on the precipitation. The next step was uh, to kind of find out the relationship between the daily information and, uh, and the maximum uh, or the annual maximum values because the annual maximum values are used to come up with the distribution of extreme uh, precipitation. And in that process, we utilize something that's called the support vector machine, which is nothing else than a sophisticated regression analysis. So you use the, you use the information between the data and the mag daily maximums and uh, uh, link that to the kind of sub-daily uh, uh, values. And basically on uh, this uh, grid uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was fed by the, the reanalysis data, we were able to come up uh, with now annual maximums of different kind of durations. This is obtained uh, for the whole country. 
And then we did some checking. Uh, we wanted to be sure that this approach uh, produces for the places where we have measurements, produces the data that's relatively close to the measured values. And we noticed that there are you know, good agreements in some locations and some disagreements in different locations and uh, decided to actually subject um, this generated data to one more process of kind of improving the accuracy. So how that was done, um, now this gridded information that was obtained through this regression, sophisticated regression, was actually uh, uh, linked to the 10 first and then 25 closest observation stations and some kind of modification factor was introduced for each grid cell based on the observed, obs uh, observed values at this 10 and 25 stage. So you realize this is the, like a situation when you may have a location very far in the north and the closest stations are uh, far south. And therefore, this is the reason why we were opting for larger number to actually introduce the larger potential variability in the precipitation and modify the values. So that kind of modification um, improved, uh, improved accuracy or utilized almost every information that you have on the precipitation. You have these products of the reanalysis and then you have observations and they are all kind of integrated together uh, to produce at the end uh, this particular grid, the, the, the information that can be fit into IDF relationships. But now we had a kind of, because we utilized these different ideas for modifying, we had actually four different curves for each of the grid cells, two reanalysis products, and two modification sectors, 10 and 25 stations. Uh, observation stations. So, so the, the question was, you know, which one should be used? Uh, I, we, anytime we introduce some new ideas, you end up with the multiple choices. And the users, and the public users of the web, are immediately questioning, okay, if I have multiple choices, what should I use? How should I use? So we were trying always after these kind of more research kind of analysis processes to come up with a practical kind of solution or practical recommendation. And, and in this case, what we have done, we actually found a medium value out of these four. And now when you go into the tool, and you go through the ungaged, uh, uh, ungaged module, you will have a kind of single value, and that single value is based on these four different, basically medium value of these four. Uh, okay, so that <laughs> required modification of the, uh, of the uh, um <coughs> downscaling algorithm. We had a map, gridded map with the uh, historical IDFs, uh, historical IDFs produced, as I explained previously. We have a historical uh, daily data um, in the extraction, the quantile mapping that kind of gave us. Now you have a kind of single relationship of daily uh, information, and this gridded uh, gridded product was already in a kind of sub daily sub daily form. So the future data was again used as in a previous case uh, extraction, fitting the distribution, and that relationship uh, between the daily uh, historical and daily future was established. So you see the difference between the gauge locations, the, 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 the downscaling relationship with sub-daily and daily was replaced with the developed product uh, uh, for the, or the map for the, uh, for the sub-daily information. And uh, in a mathematical form, uh, this relationship uh, was developed uh, in a <coughs> kind of similar way, ending up in now precipitation, precipitation of different duration and density for each of the grid cells, uh, giving us or giving you opportunity to actually identify the value or find the value of updated or modified uh, precipitation under different climate models for any for any any location.
So you see two different kind of approaches which were needed for gauged and ungaged, ungaged locations. So that was the key kind of methodology that's you know carrying the most of the uh, most of the analysis within the tool. <coughs> Um, here is how we implemented the tool. So the, the, the methodology was developed and now the question was how are we going to uh, make that work and uh, with the, this whole programming development was done by Andre um, and uh, we opted with so-called the traditional decision support format where you kind of integrate the user interface for a model base and the databases. Um, in the user interface, you try to communicate, obtain the input from the users, provide the output to the user, visualize the uh, information in any form that user may benefit from. In the model base, you store all the mathematical kind of tools, so the quantile matching algorithm, the uh, distribution <coughs> gamble, uh, extreme value, they're all kind of stored. The optimization model, everything is stored in the model base, and uh, the process simply kind of searches and combines and takes the information from the database, uh, from the model base, in order to generate the information required by the user. And in the database, we store all the, all the uh, information. This database is very rich now, and the point is that we are storing all the historical data for all the stations across the country. We are storing, the, storing this grid product for the ungaged locations, and we are storing for all 24 uh, climate models all the information for every location in the country. So everything is in the database, independent database, so the tool does not require reaching you know, any other location. Um, and that's the reason why it's very efficient and can actually do the calculation and modification very, very fast. Database. <coughs> Database right now is a repository that I mentioned of all the available historical information for the 700 stations. Um, the, the, there is a more stations available, but not all the stations in Canada have, have the sub-daily observations. <coughs> These 700 stations are the stations that provide the sub-daily information. Some of them even have a relatively short <laughs> records of the sub-daily data, and I'll show you the, the tool will immediately tell you how much, uh, or, you know, uh, how long time series is available, and there are suggestions if the time series is too short that cannot be effectively used to fit the distribution. Um, the tool also offers opportunity to, for users to create their own stations. We added this opportunity because many of the um, utilities, uh, hydropower and power utilities especially, are doing their own measurements. And they're independent you know, from the <coughs> federal government and Environment Canada, but they don't publish this information. They just you know, collect the data for their own use. So if they are using this uh, tool, they can bring this data in and they can limit the use. So they can say, okay, we are going to share within our organization or the users from our organization, but that's not going to be available to other users outside of them. If they want, they can also share. So we kind of created a lot of flexibility. It's up to the user, you know, how they want to deal with their own, their own data. <coughs> the climate model data are available, as I pointed out, for these 24 uh, bias corrected methods, that's the newest uh, part of the database. And um, you're familiar that most of the climate models are producing the four, or the data is published for four different uh, uh, emission scenarios. So now they're called representative critical path scenarios, RCPs. Um, and actually, the models, the climate models are not performing simulations for four of them. They are performing simulations for these three, and the six RCP, six is actually interpolated. 
So we decided to eliminate that one because that you can do that very easily instead of interpolating the climate input, you can interpolate the IDFs at the end, you know, and obtain the kind of same information. So uh, the, the, idea, the idea was really to use the information that's generated by the climate model communities. I have to point out that not only uh, each model has a ra different runs for uh, uh, different RCPs, they also, because the climate models are very sophisticated numerical tools, 100, 120,000 differential equations, and they have a so-called multiple runs being done, basically simulations which, star which start with the different boundary conditions in order to stabilize the numerical schemes in solving the differential equations. So you can quite often, when you access the climate data sources, obtain the scenarios uh, for the so-called multiple runs. And we downloaded, or we are downloading all the time, all the information available for each of the, each of the models. <coughs> the ungaged, uh, ungaged data set is uh, produced, that, that what I was talking about, the gridded information is uh, produced and imported uh, for the whole Canada land, ma uh, land mass. The, the, the grid cell size is between 5 and 10 uh, kilometers and it's a pretty high level of resolution for the product like this. User interface is uh, um, developed to provide the manipulation, select the, uh, the locations, um, uh, perform or uh, go through the process of the updating the curves, doing that analysis with historical, with future uh, scenarios, choose the scenario, uh, produce, the, produce the updated relationships in a tabular form, in a graphical form, in the form of equation, basically the formats that usually the engineers are using and we really follow the requirements that were suggested by them. Uh, model base contains the statistical algorithms, uh, the update algorithm or quantum matching scheme, optimization model, and uh, the reason and this type of organization is very flexible. If you get the new, uh, if you get the new data, you replace the part of the database with the new data. This is what we have done now in August by putting the new climate data in. Um, if you would like to add some analysis, you modify the kind of user interface. If you would like to introduce, let's say, different optimization scheme or some other uh, algorithm, you add to the model base. So, so you don't need to change the whole <laughs> kind of reprogram the whole kind of set. You actually focus on the segment that the improvements or modifications are uh, required. That's a very flexible architecture. I mean, the development or web development architecture that can be done. <coughs> um, this is the user interface. I already did show that to you. It has uh, this kind of essential features and also the uh, selection of engaged and uh, engaged location part. And by selecting this, the tool kind of leads you through the process and um, the first potential use is replicating the kind of historical curves, let's say, that the Environment Canada is providing. Um, the, in that process, uh, you start with the map that's being displayed and location of the observation stations. Um, if, or sorry, um, when the selected uh, location is being uh, uh, clicked on, the background uh, work starts, the, all the information is being loaded into the system uh, and uh, the data is organized uh, and brought from the database into the calculation analysis is being done to check the necessary information, especially always the time series is, are being checked to, you know, for zero values, negative values and things like that, that may be the product of either the mistakes and so on. Uh, calculating the parameters of the distribution, calculating the 
IDFs and then presenting this by fitting the equation and presenting in a tabular and, um, and, and uh, graphical form. This is the graphical form of the presentation. So the dots you see are basically the calculated values. Um, uh, we are doing the calculation. I thought I mentioned that. Um, for uh, these 2, 5, 10, 25, 50, and 100 years return periods and uh, uh, for the durations up to, five, uh, uh, up to five minutes. And just before I arrived here, um, one, uh, one request is coming and in a repeated form, and the users are interested, can we actually extend the calculation and present the curves for the uh, uh, um, you know, return periods of 500 years and more? And I have to think about, you know, what can we do and is it appropriate to do it. Um, <coughs> so the, the, the calculated values are shown as the dots here. And these are different return periods. Obviously, the, you don't see very well in the resolution of the screen. Uh, these values are also stored in the tabular form. This is exactly the format how the Environment Canada is providing the data. And what you see as a line here is basically that fitted relationship by optimization algorithm. And some of the users are using only the equation. So you provide them with the equation and then they calculate the values uh, for their own. This is all happening, you know, really in a second. <laughs> you know, when you, when you kind of select uh, uh, select the station, you identify the historical, uh, almost immediately you get the values um, uh, presented to you, and you have choices here from table, graphs, and uh, equations for presenting the final results. Many users were asking us, you know, how can we now use this data and bring into, let's say, our reports or, uh, you know, spreadsheets to show graphs in a different form and so on. So we provided here the opportunities that the data can be <laughs> downloaded uh, um, and directly basically imported into the spreadsheet for any form of processing that you may, uh, you may need. Uh, for, uh, if you, so, so this was a historical and this is the future idea of curves. When you go through the process of the future uh, uh, or calculation or updating, you know, different steps are being now involved and these are the steps of kind of implementing the matching algorithm uh, um, and so on. Um, the, the, the kind of key, there are three decisions that users have to, you have to make. So when you select the updated part, the screen is presented to the user, which is identifying, which requires um, by the user to identify the climate model that, you know, user would like to use. Uh, the period of prediction the user want, and the period can be between zero and 100 years to 2100. And the third, uh, uh, <coughs> and the third uh, uh, piece of input is uh, the, the, now I am lo I'm losing my, my thought. Uh, what was the third piece of input? Okay, we'll go together through that and, uh, yes, sorry, the emission scenario emission scenario. So, so the, the period of the future projection and the choice of models are on the separate screen. And uh, the, the choice of the uh, emission scenario is directly presented as the menu, as the menu here. Now, in the use of the models, you have a multiple, or choice of the model, you have a multiple ways how you can do that. There are 24 different models right now in you can use each of them individually. So you can click, I want to use the Canadian model, and the calculation will be done using Canadian model. Or you can select any 
combination of models. I want to use three or four of these models. They're being you know, suggested for our region. And the tool will be combining the information for these models into so-called ensemble and run the analysis for that you know, ensemble of models. Or you can click the general ensemble and all the models uh, will be utilized and the analysis being done for that. Now, this is where most of the most of the questions are most of the questions are coming from the users because they have a choice. Uh, they have a choice of the model. They have choice of ensemble. What's the difference? How, when should we use this, and so on? And I'll I'll give you a little bit of kind of my suggestions. You know how this can be done, but this is really in the in the hands of the in the hands of the users. Uh, when <coughs> the future curves are being done and process selected for the future curves. The, the, the tool again in the background does most of the analysis, uh, read the kind of selected models or model, depending on the user's choice, extract the data series for that particular model, organize the series, fit, uh, do the quantile matching, find the relationships, and then fit the distributions and again present in the same form uh, fitted data, um, either tabular or graphical or uh, equations. Um, we added, that was, again, uh, that was again the request from the user's community because of the different models. If you use different models, you will realize that you are going to get different idea of curves. Um, the, the difference exists between the ways how the physics is modeled by the different uh, GCMs, and that's reflected in the final uh, values of precipitation, temperature, and other variables that these models are generating. So uh, what we have done for the set of models that tool includes, uh, we provide so-called the range of uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty being introduced by the choice by the choice of the model, and this piece of information, uh, okay, I will sh I'll show you. I have it a little bit later. This piece of information is very relevant because you may immediately see that for the particular location, the difference between the models is really not significant, and in that case, you can go with the ensemble of all the models. Uh, in some cases, you will see that that range is pretty significant, and that means that you need carefully uh, to make decision, you know, which model you are going to use. Are you going to use the ensemble, which will put you somewhere in the middle, or are you going to go with something, you know, <coughs> more conservative or less conservative, depending on the use of information. Okay, so... Um, for the uh, ungauged locations, the, the, the kind of process is relatively similar, but it's utilizing the procedure and methodology that I mentioned. You are now not presented, you are presented with a map of the country as a kind of input, and by simply clicking on the particular location, uh, you, will be, you will be getting into the process of calculation. Uh, you can enter the location by simply, uh, you know, walking on your map, or you can enter the coordinates of the location and, you know, do the, enter in that way into the process. Again, um, you have the similar kind of use, historical and future, but the historical curves are based on that gridded, input data that's kind of had in a fixed form inside and presented in the same uh, in the same format these are the tables compared to the graphs that i did show but you have a table graph and equations so the system reads and organizes data from the database for each grid cell and obviously focuses on the location that you selected calculate the idea of curves from the extracted parameters calculate the average curve because i said we have four of four of them, uh, the two reanalysis products and uh, two sets of correction factors, 10 and 25 stations. So the tool does calculation for all four of them and then finds the, finds the uh, average IDF curve, fit the interpolation equation through the optimization and come up, comes up with presenting this information for the user. When you go, so, so this is basically reading that input gridded map generated through the process of uh, uh, 
regression analysis, sophisticated regression and analysis and uh, reanalysis data. For the future, or the up, uh, updating, you kind of select direction to go through the future. You're again presented with options of the emission scenarios. And now the tool is kind of performing that matching, uh, uh, quantile matching, using the, uh, the selected model or models, uh, extracting the grid points for the selected locations, organizing, <laughs> applying the <coughs> quantile matching downscaling, calculating distributions, and generating one out of the f four products, fitting the equation, organizing data for the presentation. So this is what is kind of happening in the, in the background. So just a summary, <coughs> updating uh, is one way of utilizing the tool where you can go from the, in the case of the <coughs> in the case of gauge locations, select the station, historical IDF and future IDF generation. Um, if you are the user who has the data for the station, you can import or create that station, uh, provide data to other users or use for yourself, and then perform the kind of same analysis with your data. Uh, historical future IDF updates. For the ungaged location, you just have a selection of the location and generation of the historical or updated updated curves. That's, I think this is, this is, I have a little bit more, but this is a good point to make a break. Guys, do you have, I overloaded you probably with a lot of stuff, but if you have questions, I'll clarify some of them. <coughs> Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Bruno. I'm a master's student here as well. Uh, I'd like to know if you have tried to adapt that program to another country besides, uh, apart from Canada. Mm. <coughs> we didn't. We don't have, you know, finding nor information in other countries. Yes. But <coughs> we've been contacted by many. Uh, people and uh, as far as I know the attempt was made in Germany to do uh, something similar and Also the lady from Italy was in communication with us with a similar interest um, Andre Chardong who was working with me on this is from Brazil and I know that he was talking to some people uh, in Sao Paulo uh, about the tool and the potential you know to develop something like this in um, in Brazil but I don't know what's the outcome out of that. We, we, we cannot get involved in a, you see because you need access to data you need access to the procedures and methodologies being used but the tool is kind of open and you know methodology is fully uh, available so that you can replicate that uh, replicate that in different you know locations thank you <coughs> any other questions comments I have questions no for problem. you. No <laughs> uh, the first one is about when you go treat your maximum daily, yeah. yearly, do you do some outliers treatment or not? Yeah, but we, th this, is a, this is a very traditional, you know, fitting of the gamble and extreme value distribution. So what, you know, what we do, we kind of follow the, you know, very traditional procedure. You take the time series of information, you subject to first in, in the tool, you subject to the checks, and then you go into the L moments and you fit the kind of parameters to the distribution. So that's a... Um, very, very traditional. Nothing, nothing more than, oh, okay. nothing more than you know the, what you learn in hydrology. Really. <laughs> 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 and another question that I have it's because I was reading a lot of articles about that, a lot of papers, and I saw that in New York State and also in Belgium, I think they already have like these updated IDFs in the. Uh, in the standards for. Yeah. You have these already in Canada no, or not? No, we have no? a very serious process underway right now. And um, I told you we have a federal department for standardization. And they carry the responsibility for providing the guidelines and standards. 
So um, the, the community, the engineering community was pointing out that the existing standards for the development of IDFs, which is based on the historical information, is not sufficient anymore. So right now, they are in the process of producing the update to that standard. And the update involves three things. One is a review of the climate change literature, uh, a review of the impacts of climate change on Canada, and the direction how this you know, impact will be reflected in the IDF relationship, but not yet saying how the IDF relationship will be updated or should be updated. And there is a pretty significant, how I would say, um, <coughs> process or elements of the process where some people are very much uh, behind the tool that we are offering and using because of its simplicity and everything else. And some other people are much more for, you know, let the user do the choice and perform everything. And there is uh, some kind of battle going, <laughs> going on. I, I am involved in the process, but I provided very pragmatic response. I said, we develop this, it's open, it's clear, this is how it does it. 2,700 engineers are using it, and if you feel that that should be part of the standard, you do that. <coughs> I hope it will come, you know, pretty soon, but it's a, it's a kind of political and, you know, process where some forces which are really non-scientific also can result in the, in the final outcome. Okay, thank you. I'll get to myself approval. No, so I, I think we can go to the break and okay. we come back in like 50 minutes, okay?